time to time, there are places of beauty that take on an almost dreamlike significance from their associations with a great artist. This is one of them. Giverny was Claude Monet's home and workplace for the second half of his life, from 1883 to his death in 1926. The garden here was the inspiration for over 500 of his greatest works, including the famous water lily paintings. Surprisingly, the main garden is only one hectare in size, but it attracts half a million visitors every year, and its distinctive features, immortalized in Monet's paintings, are familiar to many more. This video tells the story of the garden as it unfolds throughout the seasons, through the eyes of its gardeners and some of the artists who continue to be inspired by Giverny. Monet's step-great-grandson, the artist Jean-Marie Toulgois, and his wife Claire have long memories of visiting the house and garden. Together they have a deep understanding of Giverny's part in Monet's life and work. You know, when I was a child, I was unable to explain what was my connection with Monet. My great-grandmother married Claude Monet in second marriage. It means that one of her daughter was my grandmother, Suzanne. That's all, you know, it's... Uh, but I have no blood connection. I was almost all my life in this village in Giverny, and I, uh, I've seen the garden of Monet. Uh, it was like my garden also when I was a child, because I was always here, playing in the garden with bicycle. It was crazy when I think that, at that now. But you know, when Monet died in 26, and I'm born in 27, and I think that Blanche Monet, my great aunt, who lived in the house, continue exactly the same tradition for the garden, for the ritual of the house. But for the garden, it was the same garden, you know, for, I can say, until the last war. Exactly the same plant, the same uh, routine. Uh, you had the same gardeners also there for, for 30 years, I can say. Claude Monet came in Giverny in 1883. He has a big family and uh, he needed space, a garden, and all, so on and so. And uh, he was lucky because he discovered this, this house where now you can see this beautiful garden. And he never moved after. after. Giverny is interesting because you have never the same life. It's in a certain way interesting too. It's more complicated to paint more complicated than in the south. I had the luck when I was a child to see all, not, not Claude Monet because he, he died before my, I, I was born, but all the people, uh, Blanche Monet, Theodore Butler, my, my grandfather, they worked in impressionist way. And I was trained when I was a, a child by this way, because I painted when I was a little boy. They said to me that I had to work with specific colors. It was the palette of the Monet time, you know. No, no, no uh, hearse colors and no black on my palette. And I continue to work in that way. My wife Claire and me, uh, we are very close with uh, the Monet's place because Claire worked on Monet for 20 years and she had lectures there at the Monet's place and she was also uh, very close with the people working there and uh, we continued, Claire and me, to, to have a contact, continual contact with the, the house. Well, Monet's house is quite interesting because it's a house which has been changed, remodeled, 
from the very beginning. It was probably a farm originally. And what is pretty in, in this place is that you, as any room in, in the house, you have a view on the garden. The cook was as spoiled as, as the people owning the house on that point of view. She had, uh, she always, refer well, the last cook whom I knew uh, re was always referring to the beautiful trees she could see and the beautiful plants she could overlook from, from the place she was working. She's very nice. So the kitchen in Moniz's house is one probably the most important thing in a house, apart from the studios. And uh, it's a place where kind of, it's a kind of temple in fact. By the way, although the kitchen was beautiful, he was never setting foot in the kitchen. He was giving instructions. And fortunately, because everybody was in a panic in the kitchen, that they, they were really fearing that he would come because he was a kind of patriarch, um, probably generous, but with a very difficult uh, personality and quite aloof which was not snobbishness, but was a kind of, uh, it was reserved. And that's why probably the, the, the people employed here loved him and feared him, same time. You can't live in such a house and have a very nice life, uh, as nice as possible, if you are not organized, because otherwise it's really like living in the jungle. So in this house you had a painter Somebody who needed definitely to have uh, his life organized, which is absolutely essential when you are an artist. It was very, very impressive to think that Claude Monet was working like, I can say, a worker. He was working every day. He was working every day at the same time. He was working really uh, constantly, he was thinking about what he was doing. He was really, he was never happy. He was never sure, he was never sure that what he was doing was good. And then he was starting working as early as possible. You know, when he was coming back at 11.30 for lunch, 11.30 sharp, not 11.31, <laughs> he, uh, he had a full working day behind him already. And of course he was starving. He liked the f food to be extremely authentic, fresh, uh, uh, produced uh, as, as close as possible. That's why he was growing in, in, in Giverny. You had to uh, collect certain vegetables at a certain time of the day, early morning, because they were fresh, because they were recovering from their nights, whatever, and they were tiny and that size. And that. But that, that's a requirement from your refinement, in fact. And I think the whole house was like that, simple but refined. After the death of Monet, Blanche continued to live here, and she continued the exact ritual for everything. It means that when I was a child, when I had five years, when I was five years old, the life was certainly like when, when Monet was alive. And it's very strange to think when I was a little boy, I, I remember now the ritual. It could look from outside that it was a difficult uh, way of life but it's not true you know uh, everything was uh, so nice so uh, the environment was so beautiful and uh, uh, the people were very very open also and it was for me something incredible after blanche monet's death in 1947 the garden lost its last direct link with monet and slipped into decline its almost miraculous rebirth 30 years later was the result of the tireless work of Monsieur Gérard Van de Kemp, who recruited head gardener Gilbert Vahy to help him. I came here in 1976 and there was a constant evolution of the garden during the restoration work from then until 1980 when we opened to the public. After that it was the visitors who made the biggest change. Monsieur Vahy works with eight full-time gardeners 
a similar number to Monet's own garden staff. In a garden as intensively planted as this, they are constantly employed, lifting plants, propagating, planting out, pruning, cutting back, and of course, deadheading. But it's when the garden closes to the public at the end of October that the hard work really begins. Winter is the most important. That's because in winter we have to sort out all the perennials. There are some really beautiful ones. They have to be divided and the ones that are over are thrown out, but we take special care of the ones that are beginning to shoot and reclassify any which were planted in the wrong place the previous year. You could leave them in situ, of course, but in winter you can't tell what colour they're going to be. So we bring them on in here and then put them back in the right place. So you can see, this winter work in preparation for spring is absolutely essential. On top of all that, there's feeding and mulching to strengthen the plants. And we need to check which plants have finished, find more and replace them. In spring, everything starts to warm up, and it's time for an underplanting of seeds, which we sow straight into the beds in March, and which give a natural feel to the planting. We try to ensure that each plant is in the right place, because you can guarantee that if a wallflower is planted where there's a bulb or over a clump of asters, it'll be lost by spring or soon after. There are three different types of planting in the spring. Firstly, we sow straight into the beds. These flowers just grow haphazardly wherever they feel like it, and this gives a really natural look to the planting. We also have certain plants which we tend to sow in set places, but every so often they're completely different. These are things like nigella or love in the mist, poppies and that sort of thing. Finally, there's another lot of plants which follow a more conventional cycle, dividing, potting up and planting out. And we actually plant these when they're practically in flower. After the austerity of winter, Giverny undergoes its most dramatic transformation. Spring is heralded by the birds suddenly starting to sing their hearts out. Winter mornings are very quiet and still, then all at once the birds wake up and start singing their mating songs. Snowdrops start to appear all over the garden and we know winter is finally over. And this year we had a really amazing spring because the weather was particularly mild. We didn't have too much rain, there were no frosts and the plants came up gently at their own pace. So it was a particularly trouble-free year. Not too many pests or diseases and a beautiful show of flowers and blossom. It was particularly unusual for the fruit trees to flower so early. They normally come out quite a bit later. This year, though, they blossomed at the same time as the narcissi and the tulips. And looking back at other years, you can see this was quite exceptional. The result was that everything flowered really early. First the narcissi, then the tulips, followed by the biennials, and then the minute we had our first warm spell, all the irises and even the early roses started to bloom. By April, the garden has exploded with the bold colour contrast that Monet loved. 
the intense pinks of the cherry and crabapple blossom, and the ranks of brilliant tulips that first caught Monet's eye on a visit to the bulb fields of Holland. Tout le travail, et nous avons quatre mois pour préparer le printemps, donc... There's all sorts of work. We have four months to get ready for spring, so we spend the winter digging, replanting, dividing, reorganizing. But after that, it's really the weather that does the work of bringing the new growth on. We have very little to do with it. It speeds up as spring gets underway. Of course, the faster things grow, the faster we have to work, but it is beautiful to see nature in action like that. All that wonderful, fresh, new growth. And we appreciate it even more because we've been deprived of it during the winter months. As the season progresses, though, we get busier and busier with sowing, dressing, staking, deadheading, a million and one jobs. We replace any flowers that have gone over and generally have less time to notice how beautiful it all is. If you can still find time to look up and take in the beauty, then that's great. That's how it should be. But, well, we're always behind schedule, and we really only get a break in winter. And that's only at a matter of speaking, because we're actually busy all winter getting ready for spring. The garden opens to the public on the 1st of April. By May, Giverny is a vision of blues and mauves. Monet loved irises. They were the stars of his original garden and second only in his affections to the water lilies. And it's when they come out that his technique of grouping tones of one colour really comes into its own. Artist Kay Fassett visited in late spring when the irises were giving way to the pinks of early summer. For years I've been dreaming of coming to this garden and it's almost like walking back into a dream. I've been aware of Monet since I was a small child and increasingly the thing that probably attracted me to him as I became an artist was his use of color. I mean, his wonderful layers and layers and layers of color so that what started out as a decorative piece would become intensely complex in the reflections and the inner shadows and outer shadows. So coming to this garden, um, it is impossible to see something as rich and beautiful as this without seeing it through Monet's eyes and what wonderful eyes to see it through. And now that I'm here, I'm seeing all of the things that I've kind of experienced in an imaginative way as I looked at his paintings. I'm trying to paint this incredibly beautiful luminous object of a poppy and all of the shades of lavender and pinks and so forth are so difficult to catch. But I've heard that Monet painted a subject like a flower over and over until he began to get the mystery of that coloring, the clarity and the richness. It would seem to me that Monet was really making himself the most luscious subjects for painting. I mean, just color moods that were constantly changing, playing with pinks and blues and very, very delicate colors, and then going into hot, rich colors, and also lots of scales and shapes, big, bold blossoms, and then delicate little pansies and little spots of color. I can just see him painting this.
looking at the salmon pink of this house with the green shutters, and then these hot pink geraniums with candy pink roses, I can't help but think that Monet was really playing with this color scheme down into the greens, and then spotting great shaggy poppies of hot orangey pink throughout the garden to just carry on that lovely pink theme. It's so delicious. It's wonderful off kind of colors that happen in this garden. I mean, these poppies, as if they're just dipped in wine, with just a very slight stain to them. Gorgeous papery color. The older I get, the more I am totally attracted to dark, strange coloring in plants. Look at this kind of chocolate maroon overlay to this crimson rose. This bud particularly has these kind of burnt tones that really turn me on. And the texture of it is just edible. over the top with color, and yet all of the color groups melt and harmonize beautifully with each other. The lavenders with the pinks, the oranges even, and the yellows, which I usually don't like, are finding a beautiful smooth place. I think that the overriding impression of Monet's garden is not to be afraid to use color, but to harmonize. beds, which Monet planted specially for experimenting with different color palettes. I mean, imagine having the luxury of being able to plant living colored structures that would be changing throughout the seasons, and to be able to walk down through the garden painting all of these different moods as the mood strikes you. I think Monet must have had a wonderful sense of theater, which is something I love in any artist's work. And I think the way it really manifests itself the strongest was the way he planted the flower beds in a very subtle manner so that you got very deep, rich tones in the beginning of the beds. And then toward the end of the bed, they would get softer and softer, giving this incredibly exaggerated sense of space. I'm sure that Monet every day of his life found some new aspect to this garden. And all these years later, we as humble painters can come in his wake and paint our own personal slant and mystery in this garden. And that's a very extraordinary thing that we're allowed in here to be part of this ongoing discovery of this very, very exquisite masterpiece of a garden. Through the spring and summer, the colors in the garden change constantly, from blues, whites, and mauves to pinks and reds. Early summer is when the roses appear, the hallmark of the June garden in Monet's day. He had a special liking for climbing roses on pillars and the arches along the Grande Allée. Gardener Rémé Lecoutre explains more about Monet's theory for the paint box beds. Alors, nous voici justement dans we're standing amongst Claude Monet's paint box beds, which we call tombs because they are rectangular and shaped a bit like a grave. Monet originally planted them to use for cut flowers to make bouquets for decorating interiors. In Monet's time, each bed was planted with one single variety. But nowadays, we have rather, well, we've completely changed the system. Because although we still only have one colour per bed, or tomb, 
We plant each bed with lots and lots of different flowers in that color range. By July, as the main garden is hectic with color, the water garden is a picture of calm. In 1893, Monet bought a piece of land on the other side of the road at the bottom of his garden. It brought new dimensions both to his gardening and his painting. Photographer and writer Angevinet, Vivian Russell, came to photograph the water lilies in midsummer. I came to the garden initially about 15 years ago with my father and I was just starting out garden photography and um, I was completely knocked out by a garden which was very tall and uh, had wonderful volume and was totally what the English would consider completely outrageous and so I thought that had real sort of photographic and cinematic possibilities. Well the most interesting thing about photographing the water garden is trying to see it the way Monet saw it and for him of course it was a it was a mirror it was a it was a whole exercise an optical illusion it was all the themes of his painting that he'd ever studied and explored for the first 40 years condensed into this little pool and he called it the landscape um, of reflection because he had his clouds he had his grass he had his trees he had every permutation of light you can imagine and it was all, it was all just on his doorstep. I think Monet celebrated beauty and his genius was that he was able to do it in paint. And he was, he was doing it at a time when it was considered quite ordinary. What was outside, nature was considered very banal because it was not intellectual. And so he went out and nature excited him in a way that um, perhaps it doesn't anymore, but at that time it was a pioneering exercise. He had this amazing sight that was so hypersensitive. Nobody could see what he saw. And he had this gift of sight, of a second sight, that, um, that enabled him to paint in the way he did and drove him and compelled him to paint in the way that he did. You know, if you have that gift, it's like people who can write or people who, whatever, and they, they become Olympians. Well, he was an Olympian painter. Monet puts us back in touch with, with, with nature. People instinctively understand beauty. Beauty is seen on a very elemental level, which was landscape, light, earth, soil. You know, it's, it's, it's what's all around us and he just helps us see it. The most amazing thing for him was the revelation of his pond because it's often been said that he, he created it to paint, but he didn't, he created it. He came to it as a passionate gardener and then he discovered things in it that he couldn't have dreamed of. And so the challenge of me following in his footsteps, as it were, is trying to see the pond as Monet saw it and trying to capture that. was that they were new, which is always important in, in gardening, that no one's done it before. They were um, quite exotic in that they, they, they were sort of like outdoor lotuses, but I don't, ever, I don't think for a minute he, he thought of painting them. He wanted a water garden and there they were. And then he, when he actually looked at them and looked at them and looked at them as he did, he began to see their, their possibilities in paint. 
Monet was constantly combing plant catalogues, flower shows and nurseries for new and interesting plants. And once he had his pond, he inevitably turned to the foremost water lily specialist of the day, Joseph Bory Latour Maliak. He was the first man to understand how the sexual reproductive cycle worked to the female water lily. And by manipulating it, he succeeded in, achieve, in producing these hybrids, which were crossing between the hardy water lilies, between warmer climes and northern climes. So what you had was wonderful exotic colors that, were, that you could grow outside in a northern pond, and they were very hardy. The road between the two gardens was actually demarc demarcation in Monet's painting life. And so he went from, say, the flower garden, which was a certain kind of early Impressionist painting to late Impressionist painting. And so it was actually the art that came from this, this water garden that took painting into the 20th century. And what he did here was he broke all the rules of painting that had ever been in existence forever, and he changed the whole course of art. Nothing prepared me for seeing the water lily panels for the first time, and it's an experience that is shared by everybody who sees them for the first time. And you find that you're in a sort of time warp, that there's a suspension of all time and all reality. And I think it's the fact that there's a kind of energy and radiance and vibration that's coming off the walls. He had layer upon layer of crusty paint. And I think it's the most incredible experience in, in painting that's, that is available anywhere in the world. You could paint here and, and you could photograph here and you would never get the same effect. And, and it kept him busy and, and out of trouble for, you know, till he died. And happy, I think, and fulfilled, actually. And it got him through the war and it got him through the death of his son, the death, death of his wife. All his, all his friends were dead. He was really the last sort of old soldier left. And it was the summing up of 70 years of painting that's on those walls that he painted at the end of his life, and he knew that that was his last testament. Monet's pond was his greatest artistic inspiration, but then, as now, it needed intensive care to retain its beauty. Monsieur Valle has tried everything to keep the water pure. To start with, the pond was very opaque, because it was full of sediment, which meant none of the plants could grow as they weren't getting any light. We came up with various solutions. One was to plant the water lilies near the surface, but the water still wasn't clear, so another solution we thought of was to dam the pond. Now we have lovely clear water, but that's encouraged lots of weeds to grow, and we've had to build a special boat to get out and harvest them. Even this hasn't worked, because of course, the more you cut them, the more they grow. And so this year, we've brought in living creatures, fish, Chinese carp, and as another measure, we've brought in an extra person to physically weed out the unwanted plants and leave the good oxygenating ones, which the water needs. Monet's water lilies, with their suggestion of eastern lotus flowers, were part of an overall vision for his water garden that was inspired by his interest in Japanese art and design. Japanese garden designer Takashi Sawano visited in September. The first time I am coming to Monet's garden about um, 12 or 13 years ago, it's um, quite a shock. Normally I'm designing a Japanese garden outside of Japan. I always think about a uh, lot of Japanese ornament, uh, such as stone lantern, Japanese tea house, 
Japanese proper bridge, stepping stone. Um, but when I see this garden without sort of typical Japanese own garden ornament, and just creative uh, philosophical background and uh, atmosphere, and I think he doesn't want to say a Japanese garden, but he just wants to um, oriental influence garden that he wants. When I see uh, his uh, design for bridge, it's um, not traditional, not authentic Japanese bridge. Uh, two reasons. One is uh, angle or degree is slightly different. And another most, uh, I was surprised, he painting is green color. And the Japanese traditional bridge is never ever painted green. Normally Japanese bridge uh, is kind of reddish, um, color, we call shoe color, and because original idea is bridge uh, come from Shinto uh, shrine or Shinto temple, and all of that shoe color is um, always symbolized for uh, Shinto uh, religion. Japanese gardens, uh, most important material is water. When we designing garden, always thinking first of water, where the position, how to make it, what kind of situation. And also its uh, plant material is very important. For example, this willow is uh, beautiful all around the nearly touch of the water surface. And of course water lily, and then azalea, and then uh, bamboo. And it is a fantastic situation. This is a bamboo called Japanese name is Take and one of the most important material in the Japanese garden and also Japanese environment. And I have a lot of um, good uh, experience and feeling for bamboo and especially for bamboo forest like here. This plant called Murasaki Shikibu is a very old ancient Japanese plant and we're using a lot of this material for Japanese tea ceremonies for arrangement. This Mikonos daisy is growing all over Japan and uh, quite ancient plant and one of the seven autumn grasses. He pick up uh, our one of uh, traditional style of um, uh, garden called um, Kaiyushiki, and that design quite often like a very big like a park, and um, water is middle of a uh, garden, and you can walk around uh, around the water, and every angle, every um, distance is different view. It is quite different sense of composition between east and west. Um, for example, Monet's Garden's uh, water garden, you can see the bridge is not center of the water. And also on the bridge, you can see uh, balance way of left side is a huge uh, willow tree. And the right side is very uh, small grass in the, on the edge of uh, pond. And that uh, not 50-50, but 70-30. Nice balance and not a uh, proper focal point, but you can see somewhere in the garden is focal point. That's a very oriental way. Wisteria called Fuji and uh, also one of the most popular material and ancient plant in uh, original come from China. Of course, Western uh, garden, uh, you planting to wisteria, but a different way. Western way is uh, side of wall, it's climbing up. But the Japanese way, is we can do it uh, sort of trellis and uh, 
flower blossoming to can, can see it down. And we still like very much Japanese uh, uh, wine called sake. And um, if you give a lot of sake, it's uh, next year's blossoming is a double size. I think Mone is crazy about in the drink and the food, so probably he heard about that story and he gave a lot of wine to Wisteria. <laughs> when I see a Mone's painting, I can see quite a lot of idea he um, take from Japanese balance and the focal point. And that's why one reason a um, lot of Japanese people like his painting. I knew uh, Monet collecting Japanese painting, but when I went first time in his house, I was quite shocked because from bottom to top, it's hundred, hundred um, Japanese printing there. Um, so I thought, of course, Monet never been to Japan, but he felt it every day in the house. About 100 years ago, Japan opened for, uh, officially for open for public, and then a lot of Western people have been to Japan and get print. Mone saw first time in the Japanese wood print in Holland, and he realized how beautiful um, that wood print, and he studied from that print. Um, so a lot of imagination come from his collection of Japanese wood carp. The color combination too, very, um, not very strong, Color, very calm and sort of like a milky, uh, misty way of color uh, combination he drawing. That I think very close to Japanese atmosphere and the taste. I think um, before he died, he understand is simple is more better and the simple is more best. That's why he created finally Japanese water garden this is um, very close to Japanese uh, Zen philosophy and uh, Japanese painting. And um, that before he died, he understand it. As summer turns to autumn, the main garden breaks free from the discipline of earlier months. In the late summer light, it glows with mellow color. Monet's visitors at this time of year always remembered his magnificent display of dahlias, asters and sunflowers. But the pièce de résistance is the extraordinary carpet of trailing nasturtiums along La Grande Allée. Watercolorist Paul Riley painted there in September. It's very frightening when you see Monet in the original. I remember going to the Marmotan Museum some years ago and seeing a lot of Monet's paintings in the, in the flesh, as it were, and being absolutely gobsmacked. It was just phenomenal to see the surface of the paint. That was the most extraordinary thing. And the power of them was so strong. I was so overwhelmed, it was almost the stage where I wanted to burn my brushes. But after a decent meal, I realized that, in actual fact, he hadn't destroyed me, he'd inspired me. Coming here is a bit like rediscovering the Holy Grail. A painter's garden, a very special place where all the kind of textures you wouldn't normally associate with plants have been put together in a special way to satisfy a painter's interest and excitement. A vertical palette of colors. Everywhere, something different. The whole place is redolent of a specific purpose, the reason for his painting. He could put his easel practically anywhere and almost en face, as they say in French, there was a painting. He specially planted the garden so that instead of having great clumps of the same kind of flower, 
almost, if you like, saying in display of a particular species, he would mix and match. And even down this alley, which is especially fine with the distribution of nasturtium, he was orchestrating the colours as though they were little touches of paint. I'm sure he probably knew the names of a lot of the plants, but that wasn't important to him. What was infinitely more important was the fact that it was colour, haphazard, almost natural, although as you can imagine, to create this extraordinary effect, it was hardly haphazard. He saw colour as though it was an eminence, something that poured off and surrounded like a kind of special light, the objects, so that they didn't, for example, appear static. They had a kind of mobility. And this way was his way of seeing. He wasn't seeing the object. He was seeing the eminence that came from that object. And as such, it's particularly exciting for a painter. And sitting in this alley, I can sense this incredible feeling of being enveloped by light and color. the term pochard, which was a, a very quick, very liberal way of painting, very active, almost like a form of um, quantalism stroke action painting. And in his later life, he used extraordinarily powerful strokes, I think partially due to the fact he could barely see. I can't see very well myself. And in fact, I've deliberately left my glasses off so as I can almost generate that uh, envelope of colour that he so desperately sought this instantaneity of his painting. Instantaneity was a word he used quite a lot instead of impressionism. And in a way, that's how I like to think. Poor old Monet had a terrible shock later in life. An envelope started to appear over his eyes in the form of cataracts. And it was a very slow process. It must have been absolutely appalling the worst thing that could happen to a painter. The drawback with the cataracts was that gradually a lot of the red started to go. And then his favorite, blues, to literally at the point at which it was monochromatic light, no color at all, just black, grays. Awful. In his day, there were hardly any remedies they had to peel away the layers of skin from his eyes. And then, after the operation, he was kept immobile with sandbags around his head so that he couldn't move. It must have been a desperate time. His recovery was extremely slow and painful. But recover he did, bit by bit. And with it, returned his enthusiasm for painting. And in a way, probably produced his greatest masterpieces. Monet had been considered by some to be the father of Impressionism. But as he grew older, his work entered into a new phase. After he recovered his sight, his sense of activity and the urge to generate new marks had started to attract painters from all over the world, Japan, Germany, and even America. Painters came here, settled, and watched him at work. The kind of painting he was doing was involving much more a sense of action, action painting. The kind of painting that 
the likes of the American artist Jackson Pollock was to reinvent in later years. This had a new term, this new evolved form of painting, abstract expressionism. You could say that Monet, from being the father of impressionism, had now become the godfather of abstract expressionism. He was able to, if you like, move painting, his own painting, into an entire new realm. He did these very brave, bold, colourful statements in the style of his youth. And so typical of a man when he gets to an old age, becomes almost young again. I think that's what probably is the most enduring fact about Monet when you see his later works, is this mixture of venerable old age and the instantaneity of youth. Oh, if Monet were to visit, I don't think he'd be too keen on having all these people around him. That's how it was with him towards the end of his life, when he abandoned his habit of welcoming just about everyone, such as American painters and lots of other people who came to meet him and look around his garden. He just decided one day that he'd had enough of the situation, shut his doors and wouldn't let anyone into his garden other than his family and the village priest. I think this is very much his garden. It's evolved from his ideas over the 40 years he lived and worked here. But I think if he were to come here today, he'd bring a fresh approach. A still personal but fresh approach to the garden, because he would probably have changed too. I really would love him to see it today, though, because it is his garden, after all. We've tried to recreate the same atmosphere he created in the garden, using his paintings as a guide. We also had photographs, pictures and notes to go by. And in fact, there's quite a lot of written material, including things he himself wrote. It's been said in memoirs that Monet didn't like double flowers, but just this year I found an order for some roses which Monet had written to his supplier, and he'd included species with double flowers in his list, which proves he did like them too. I hope that in future the garden will continue to be beautiful, aesthetically speaking. What's most important is to continue to strive to discover the plants which Monet loved and to make them accessible today. In other words, to find varieties from that era and bring them back into the garden. It's a wonderful opportunity to be able to create a showplace like this, and it's so exciting to find a variety which everyone thought had disappeared, trace it, and bring it back to this garden. That's tremendously satisfying. But there are lots of other things I love. Nature itself, life, the struggle against pests, diseases, weeds, the weather, all sorts of things. The way I look at it is that there are lots of good aspects to working here, which are very satisfying, and the rewards are big. There is a huge amount of work and a lot of problems, but frankly, that's what you expect, and you can learn a lot from that. And at the end of the day, it's such a beautiful place that you don't really think about the amount of work or the problems. When all said and done, we haven't tried to create a landscape here, and I don't think Monet wanted to do that either. He created a palette and then left it up to the painter or photographer to choose their angle to compose a picture from it. What you have is areas or masses of colour, and it's these colours which you see primarily as foregrounds and backgrounds throughout the garden. And what's fascinating is that you not only have these areas of colour, 
which change with the seasons, but because you can move about and see them from different views, you have a constantly changing panorama. I really think it's a brilliant way to create a garden. Instead of having a rigid design, like in the water garden, which has its permanent focal points, such as the landing stage for boats, which is beautiful for only a certain period of time, but is a permanent feature, a particular attraction in the garden. Then you have the Japanese bridge, which is another structural feature. The bridge is rounded in shape, and then on either side he planted petasites, which have lovely rounded foliage to echo that shape. It's a stunning design, but it doesn't change, it's the same each year. Whereas in the Clos Normand, nothing ever stays the same, it's constantly evolving. I hope I'm helping preserve Monet's memory here. I'm always conscious of trying to do that, even though it causes a bit of conflict at times. As the autumn draws on and the first frosts threaten, it's time once again for Monsieur Vahe and his team of gardeners to put the garden to bed for the winter. Personally, I really like the change. I love the way the garden is constantly evolving. And it is still really interesting in winter, even though it does look a bit deserted and bare. It gives us a chance to move the perennials, for instance, to fill any gaps in the beds and to decide how the garden is going to evolve in the future. I really do love this constant change. It's essential to the life of a garden that it goes on evolving and developing. If you've enjoyed this video, there are many more Newnham videos to add to your collection. For the next best thing to the live demonstrations from RHS experts, you can choose from the instructive titles in the Practical Guide series, from herb growing to gardening in the greenhouse. Alternatively, you can take an armchair tour through the world's great gardens. The Society's magnificent showpiece reveals its secrets in the four titles of the Wisley Through the Seasons series, and we tell the story of the birth of a great national garden in Rosemore, a garden in the making. There's even a chance to learn more about the extraordinary gardens and flowers of South Africa.
for a brochure covering all the RHS gardening videos and some 50 other special interest titles, contact us here at the Newnham Video Collection.